Welcome to the APO Productivity Talk Series. I am Sowan Chai Lo Hawatanakun, Executive Director of Thailand Productivity Institute and the moderator of today's P-Talk. Today's topic is Untold Essence of the Toyota Production System, TPS. No management approach can be panacea for all business problems. In other words, for every management approach, there exists a set of conditions under which the approach would work effectively. On the other hand, if a management approach is effective under certain conditions, there is potential for its effectiveness to be generalized beyond the current boundaries. The purpose of this session is to examine the Toyota production system, TPS, from these perspectives. Viewers can learn about the untold essence of the TPS, contributing to their own management methods for enhanced productivity. To help us navigate this fascinating topic, we are honored to have Professor Emeritus Ushio Sumita with us today. How are you today, Hi, Professor? You. Please let me introduce you for a minute. Professor Ushio Sumita is currently Professor Emeritus of the University of Tsukuba. Japan. He is also a representative of Ushio Consulting, a contract lecturer of Graduate School of Business Administration, Keio University, Japan. Previously, he was associated with the Graduate School of International Management, GSIM, at the International University of Japan, serving as dean and holding various other positions. Thank you very much for your kind introduction. Thank you, Professor. Let me begin the session by asking Professor Sumita for further clarification of what the TPS is and why we need to learn about it from the productivity standpoint. TPS is a systematic approach for managing manufacturing processes developed by Toyota over the past 100 years or so. Its basic idea is symbolized by the slogan to produce exactly needed things at exactly needed times in exactly needed quantities. It drew the worldwide attention when Japan suffered from two waves of oil crises. While most of Japanese corporation performances dropped down, Toyota's profitability remained intact. And then people started asking why, and Toyota was generous enough to share its basic approaches. Today, we are going to discuss some of the mechanical aspects of TPS, but as well as we analyze TPS from new, pers new perspective, focusing on its functionality so that you can apply it much beyond the scope of manufacturing, enhancing your product productivity. Professor Sumita, please go ahead with your presentation. Thank you very much. What you learn for enhanced productivity from today's lecture? I'd like you to familiarize yourselves with the historical background of TPS and its evolutional paths. In particular, you will gain an insight into the key functions of TPS and you can apply basic ideas much beyond the scope of manufacturing. Also, I'll briefly mention about the danger of blindly applying TPS approaches mechanically. Under what conditions, mechanical aspects of TPS would be effective. This is also an important aspect of today's lecture. Automobile industry has been the driving force for business innovation in the world. In Germany, for example, automobile industry stemmed, started there, you know, four cycle engine by auto, two cycle engine by uh, Benz. Then Ford came into the scene by inventing conveyor line. 
in Europe, in the original era, automobile was produced manually for noble people. Mass production was not there. Ford came up with an idea of conveyor line where main body of the automobile would travel on the, on the conveyor, workers would stand along the conveyor and assemble. This enabled them to produce massive volume of automobiles. Then came GM. GM innovation was establishment of business uh, division that we observe widely today. Mr. Sloan was then the leader of GM. GM had very much difficulty in catching up with Ford, but he was a fine financial uh, you know, analyst and he was familiar with operations in, 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 in that area. So instead of just producing one model, he made up several business division, each of which would produce its own uh, model. So GM could produce multiple models within one year, and this gave the company the competitive edge against Ford. Third wave of innovation in the automobile industry came from Toyota, and this is the TPS, lean production. In particular, in 1990, a group of uh, MIT researchers published a book called The Machine That Changed the World. And this spread the basic idea of a Toyota approach all over the world. And since then, TPS would be like the Bible for manufacturing industry. And uh, we will see that even TPS would be effective only under certain conditions. But at the same time, the reason why TPS became so prevalent, there would be reasons that could go beyond manufacturing industry. So we reveal the secrets of TPS from these two new perspectives today. If you look at the historical evolutionary path of uh, TPS, original idea came from the founder, Sakichi Toyota, who was the just elementary school graduate. This is in the late 19th century when Japan was experiencing a major revolution. The country was eager to catch up with the West. And then Sakichi wanted to make his own contributions, but he didn't have any educational background. He walked around the you know, Aichi area and observed that the, the ladies, okay, farmers, uh, farmers' wives do this uh, looming, manual looming uh, uh, during the very severe winter. So he came up with an idea of developing automated looming machine. Of course, at that time, automated looming machine, British was well ahead of uh, Japan. But one idea highlighted success innovation, which was automated stopping system, automatic stopping system for looming machine. If you get some knot, you know, to, uh, from the thread, and you continue to make this fabric and complete, you you come up with the uh, you know defect. Then you have to undo, and then redo, to get the proper product. He thought that this is a double waste, so he devised that mechanism. It's kind of a sensor, you know, it's not the kind of the, the sensor we observe today. But as soon as the machine, looming machine, identify the, the defect of the thread, machine would stop there. And this is the origin, very origin of TPS. When you have defects and other problems, there are reasons behind it. Don't hide them. Stop the operation and then fix it and then start. 
this is very much against the traditional uh, idea of manufacturing management. It used to be that in manufacturing, throughput is the key performance indicator. No matter what happens, you don't stop the throughput. So if you have important production machines, you prepare the stand-up machine. You rather have high safety inventory stock so that the throughput would never stop. TPS reversed these ideas. It claimed that these are waste. Then a further did idea became came up with an idea of Shoichiro Toyota, which was the son of Sakichi, who visited uh, the United States to observe the Ford operation then, and they visited the supermarket, and then they came up with an idea of pull system, which means that the uh, if you visit the supermarket in the U.S., shoppers do the shopping, inventory level, the store would go down, Store owner will go back to the backyard, bring out the product. If the stock level of the backyard goes down, it calls up the, the manufacturers and the refill the inventory. So the information flows from the market side to the upstream and materials flow from the upstream to the downstream. That's the idea of uh, the, the pool system. Uh, then it is now uh, incorporating the, 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 the digital transformation. Essence of Toyota ideas would be highlighted by continuous improvement with three hold, three important uh, poles, challenge, Kaizen, and Genji Gambits. Genji Gambits mean that solve the problem at the side, not at the desk. Then pay respect to, to the people. Now, in order to understand the TPS, let me go over briefly the, the traditional manufacturing approach. You get the information from the market, demand estimation would be done, then that would lead to aggregate production planning. You uh, categorize products for each category, you estimate the demand. And then using the master production scheduling, those Categorize the demand to be decomposed into individual products. Then, using MRP, it will be reduced to the actual operations and then the daily operations. And the capacity planning and other would be uh, planned along this line. This is the traditional approach. The backbone of this approach is so called MRP, material, material requirement uh, planning. The base is base of materials. This is a 14 inch snow blowers consist of four key components. And these components are also uh, have sub components. Then in order to schedule the production of these, each lead time would be calculated as shown here. Assembly from this would be this part. Then these four components, and these components go back further, so cascade back to prepare the planning of this production so that at certain time, one can have the one completed products. This was the traditional approach. It's called the pull system. Push system, sorry. You uh, analyze the demand from the market, come up with the production planning, then this would be both information and, and the material would flow from upstream to downstream. So if any sudden changes occur in the market, this is very inflexible in responding to such sudden changes. TPS, I, as I described through the uh, supermarket operations, this part is the same as the, the push system. When the demand estimate is done, that information would be given to the lowest op uh, operation workstation. What would be needed from upstream using a Kanban, this information would be traced toward the upstream. Then materials flow from upstream to downstream. 
So information flow from the market side to the upstream and material flow from the upstream to the downstream. This is the essence of push system. When changes occur, since this start from the end side, it's very easy to cope with such sudden changes. The other idea of the TPS is eliminate waste at the source of uh, the waste. The code of fast, waste of first kind. This is the, the excess workers, excess production from excess facilities, excess part uh, inventory. If you remain intact, this would generate another kind of waste. Waste code is waste. If you eliminate them from the very source of the causes of waste, then you have very efficient waste management. That's the idea of TPS. Eliminate the source of the waste at the barely origin. Another aspect would be line balancing. If you need this many products per month, this would be reduced to production, production per shift, then every two minutes, four minutes, eight minutes. So this is the mixed production, like AA, BA, AA, BCA. So this reduces the final inventory. You know, the basic idea of TPS is to reduce the inventory cost. Inventory cost would be the opportunity cost. Therefore, the item under inventory, the value of the item under the inventory would dictate the inventory cost. The most valuable item for inventory of the final product. So they try to reduce the, the inventory of the final products. If you, if you produce this many products per day at a time, only three switches of the, the setup time would be needed. But 480 cards go out, 240 cards go out, 140, uh, 20 cards go out, they will become the, the inventory. If you do this on a monthly basis, it, even bigger. If products come out every two minutes, every four minutes, every eight minutes, the final inventory would be much less. This is the mechanical uh, part of, of the uh, combine system. There are two kinds of combine, production combine and conveyor combine. When this workstation takes out these parts from the previous station, it takes out the uh, production compound and then move this compound to here, attaching the conveyance compound. When this workstation uh, produces its product, takes one part, needed part from this inventory facility in between, take this compound out. This becomes now product, production compound for the previous station. Now produces, pro completed what would be placed to this in uh, working process inventory and this process continues. So number of combines dictates the level of working process inventory. And by controlling these number of combines, uh, one can control the working process inventory. So QC circles and other ideas are got together to operate with much less number of combines, as less as possible. The same idea is expanded to include the part suppliers using incumbents. Now let me talk about the functional aspect of uh, TPS. Now how do you manage organization? This is uh, my version of the PDCA cycle for organizational management. First, problems to, uh, for the organization would not come as a defined one. So you have to find the symptom. Then, develop common expressions to share what the problems are. Then TPS, in my view, separates institutional problems from incidental problems. Institutional problems mean that because of the way you manage processes, no matter who the leader may be, no matter who the workers may be, the same problem would occur repeatedly. In this regard, two key factors. One of the most important factor is 
how to distrib distribute decision rights. Every organization has some kind of hierarchical structure, and therefore, who decides what should be designed. If you allocate the decision right at the upper, upper level, the decision maker is in a position to see how the subdivision interact. So overall perspective can be reflected in his decision. The merit would be he's away from the reality and uh, will be forced to make a decision based on statistics. If you lower the decision rights, the opposite thing happens. Decision maker is not in a position to see the cross divisional effects, but he can see the reality much better. Here, this summarizes merits and demerits of uh, placing decision rights at the higher level and at the lower level. So key is whether or not problem is separable. Separable means that the individual division's performance would more or less adapt to the overall uh, organizational uh, objective. So best way to distribute decision rights would be upper level come up with a set of constraints under which lower level problems would become decomposable. Let me explain my experience very briefly. I once consulted the, the oil company in the US. They imported the crude oil from the Middle West along the, the Mexican Bay to, to be uh, you know, refined and then distributed over nation. The question is how to set the gasoline price next week. Before my consulting, they used to decide vice president, you know, by collecting the, the information from various states, how competitors are doing, come up with one single price, and that applies to be uh, applied to all gasoline stations nationwide. It may be too high in some places, it may be too low in some other places, but more or less it averages out. But this is a typical decision problem of separable. You know, the performance in New York State, performance in the state of California, they will adapt. There's no need to apply one common uh, uh, price. And the state uh, managers would know much better but at the same time, the, 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 there may be difficulty in making such decisions. So I suggested them to give one standard price, give decision rights to individual state leaders within plus minus 30%, they can decide freely. By doing this, they can follow the, the, the market conditions differently and do much better. Once this, uh, you know, the, the institutional problems are to be solved, then it comes to the human problem. And then the, the, this uh, uh, spiral structure would be circulated to achieve the continuous improvement. In this regard, the one of the most important lessons that TP, you should learn from TPS is incidental error and institutional failure, incidental failure. In, in, institutional failure, as I said, it is, the reason is because of the way the job is done, not dependent on people involved. Incidental failure depends on people who are involved. So if you make a judgment when it is truly institutional failure, and if you judge it as incidental failure, the same type of problems occur repeatedly. So this risk is very high. So TPS tells it, whatever happened, whatever the problems happen, first examine the way you do the job, solve the, this, you know, the, the institutional causes first. This is a very important lesson you can learn. And now I will come up with the conditions under which TPS would be effective. Manufacturing products can be decomposed into three types, type one, type two, type three. Type one, procurement and production. Both of them would be done based on confirmed order. Type two, procurement would be done based on estimated demand 
production would be done based on confirmed order. Type three, both of them would be done based on demand estimation. And G2 would be most appropriate for this type three, or it may not be so for type one. So summary, what to learn from TPS beyond manufacturing. Develop common expression so as to systematize the problem solving procedure. Operational problems should be solved at the site, not at the desk. Eliminate the waste by removing the very source from which such waste branch out, rather than dealing with them through coping therapy. Consider every failure as institutional failure, rather than incidental failure. Transform every operational path into a critical path. In other words, if you have any redundancy, in terms of the, the management resources in doing this processing, consider it as a waste. That's what TPS teaches you. Decomposition problem into two layers with an additive structure for the lower level problem, and then lower the decision lights accordingly. Then value the bottom-up driving force for organizational management whenever possible. In the end, I would like to draw your attention to one fact. Do not adapt the mechanical part of TPS blindly. I skipped the uh, slide. You know, TPS would be effective only when you can approximate sales speed as a flow. Like I went through the example, two minutes, two cards per minute for type A car, eight minutes, eight cars per minute for type B car, and so on. Although, if you look at individual uh, dealers, it may not be a flaw, but Toyota has tens of thousands of dealers over the nation. So if you look at the factory level, it, it can be approximated as a flaw. So in TPS, the decision problem, that should be centralized at the upper level would be how to produce this production flow here. And then once this production flow is de decided, all decision rights would be lowered to these branches. And then the, the uh, unknown system and other systems, as long as you sustain the speed determined by the, the central management, if you fulfill your responsibility to sustain this, they are now additive. Other sections would not be concerned as long as you keep this uh, the common constraint. That's how you can understand the excellence of TPS from functional perspective. So if, if this flow approximation is not there, do not apply Kanban system blindly. Kanban system would cost you. You need people, you need system, and, and uh, to manage Kanban. So make sure that you can see the benefit of using Kanban in cost reduction. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor. It was wonderful to learn about the traditional production planning system and the hidden secret of TPS. Thank you very much. Now, let yeah, me start the yeah. Q&A sessions and say, my first yes. question is, how does the TPS differ from the other production system and what makes it unique? It differs in two essential ways I discussed. One is traditionally, manufacturing performance was valued by throughput. How many products Per, per unit time you can produce. And they were willing to accommodate extra cost to sustain that. TPS reversed this totally. No, 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 that's a waste. So manage well so that you don't have to incur unnecessary waste. <coughs> that <coughs> essential difference between TPS and traditional approach. The other thing, as I discussed, 
in the end, distinguish institutional problem from incidental problem. PDCA doesn't do this in checking section. Toyota claims that if you have problem, there is a reason. And those reasons are doomed to be institutional. Unless you find them, you are going to have the same problem repeatedly. And these two uh, uh, aspects are very, very unique with TPS. All right? Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. Then what are the, some common challenges that companies face when trying to implement the TPS? And how can they overcome those challenges? The, what I, 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 there are two aspects. One is functional aspects. <clears throat> they can always learn. For example, you know, think of the institutional problems first before the incidental problem that you can learn always. But when mechanical parts come, you have to be ultra careful. For example, I once did the consulting for the, the part supplier and uh, they were doing the, this uh, the just in time within the, the uh, manufacturing plant, throughout the manufacturing plant. But they did not have the negotiation power that the, the Toyota has, so they had to have safety stock rather big. So they had this on the first floor and then, then the inventory cost was generated there. But between there and then their production line on the second floor, they were doing the Kanban operation. You know, eight times a day, they bring these materials from the inventory house to the production line. And they put the extra people to do this, you know, so-called Mitsumashi, and then um, system money to manage the Kanban. All this is not necessary because inventory cost was already generated upon purchase of that. And whether you have that material in the inventory house or the, along the side of manufacturing line wouldn't make any difference. This is a critical mistake. This is one example when you apply the mechanical part of the TPS, be ultra careful. Can you explain the role of the continuous improvement in the TPS? and how companies can ensure that they are continuously improve their processes? Uh, number one, the first thing is to come up with the, the indicator to monitor. Without this, you cannot guarantee the continuous improvement. So make sure what you'd like to achieve through this uh, uh, by adopting TPS. That's the key. Then, uh, every time uh, interval or every uh, with certain time interval, monitor well. Monitor these indicators. See if you have gradual uh, improvement. These are the th uh, two important things in, in, in realizing the continuous improvement. Then there should be some misconception about TPS. What are some common misconceptions about the TPS and how can companies avoid fall into those traps. Now, by now, it should be clear. Misconception is that people think that TPS is almighty for all manufacturing industries, which is not the case, as I, as I claim. You have to be able to approximate sales speed as a flow. You must have very reasonably small setup time. You must have excellent talent so that you can reallocate the people. All these conditions are needed to implement TPS uh, mechanically. So I think you have to be very, very careful. Mm. How has the TPS evolved over time? And what trends do you see in its future development, Sensei? I think the, the TPS has been hiding many things, you know, for example, the, one of the big difference between Japan and the U.S. would be how they set the uh, part prices. In Japan, Toyota says b suppliers bring them to my to my factory. The part price would be right outside the fence of uh, Toyota. In U.S., manufacturers are the ones who would go out and collect. And because of this. For logistic operations, it's much easier in U.S. to adopt DX, whereas 
it, it's very difficult in Japan because only small players know the, the, you know, the reality of the, the logistic aspect. So this should change, I think. And by uh, many players adopting DX, many, many information, much information would become visible. And then the, this, uh, the deficiency that Japan has now in logistics would be overcome. And uh, I think that, that's a key. And it would happen uh, along with the advancement of TPS in the near future. The leadership seems to be very important. What role does leadership play in the TPS? And how can leaders ensure that their teams are aligned with these TPS principles? Oh, without the leaders, uh, on one hand, without the leaders, if you do not, uh, you have not been doing TPS before, without the leaders, you cannot introduce. But at the same time, real strength of TPS is the bottom up power. So you sh leaders should be concerned with how to extract bottom up power from people from the floor. Remember the solve this problem at the site. That's a lesson that Toyota teaches. So leaders should, do, should exercise a strong leadership in extracting the bottom of power. The charismatic leader alone wouldn't be able to implement the TPS efficiently. Yes, okay. TPS will be very, very important in this industry. Can, can you also explain how TPS principle can be adapted and applied to the public sector and what benefits could be achieved through this? As I, uh, regarding this, I think the, the organizations outside the manufacturing should focus on functional aspects of lessons that they can learn from TPS. Like I said, the, if you have problem, Think of the institutional causes first, before institutional causes. Don't blame people, scold people <laughs> in the beginning, okay? Find out whether or not the, the some mechanical part of the institutional you know, implementation is wrong. Uh, this is the one functional aspect that you should uh, learn from TPS. And uh, similar, you know, the, that I described many functional aspects in this lecture. So those lessons, they can uh, apply in, in the uh, uh, public sector and uh, not only public sector, but any organization. So in reality, Toyota developed every, uh, many, many untold uh, excellence from the function, uh, functional perspective. But on, uh, on the other hand, I would like to stress that don't think regarding the mechanical part. Don't think TPS is all muddy. This is going to be my last question, Professor. What is the one key principle of the TPS that you believe has the greatest impact on enhancing productivity and how can organizations effectively implement it in their operations? I would say the distribution of decision rights, the uh, decompose the the structure of the, the distribution of decision rights into two layers. Upper level decision maker should not give detailed uh, instruction to the lower level. They should come up with a set of constraints under which the, the subsection behind, below him would, would, can uh, work freely under those uh, constraints. At, at the upper level, as long as they work within the limitation of those constraints, it is easier to put them together for the organizational objective. I think that's the most important uh, functional aspect of TPS as far as I'm concerned. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Sumita, for your useful thoughts. Do you have any further final thoughts for our viewers? Oh, yes. I hope that... Uh, because of time limitation, I spoke maybe too fast, but uh, I hope I could uh, help you in enhancing your organization, productivity of your organization through this lecture. I hope to see you sometime, some other place. Thank you.
Thank you very much. It's very great presentation indeed. Thank you once again, Professor Sumita, for joining us today. I am sure that our viewers enjoyed the presentation and your talk. Please continue watching the APO Productivity Talks and subscribe to the APO YouTube channel. I hope to see you in the next session. Goodbye for now. Thank you.